Everyone who's tuning in online, welcome. My name's Scott. I'm the lead pastor. Thank you all for being here. It's great to be with you tonight is easily one of my favorite nights of the year, perhaps my favorite. Um, we get to celebrate with you. And yes, we, we really mean the word celebrate, even though that's a bit awkward for many in the world, perhaps, to understand why we celebrate the death of Jesus. Hopefully we'll see that in a new way, in a fresh way tonight. But we want to start by remembering the story. As you have been with us perhaps this past week, we started uh, last Saturday with a Passover meal. On Sunday, we gathered and remembered Jesus' conversation after that Passover meal with his disciples. And we're going to celebrate and remember that once again tonight with the Lord's Supper. So if you, um, hopefully you received a little chalice like this on your way in this morning. If you didn't, just pop up your hand and my friend Matt and David here will come and just uh, grab you one. Don't worry, just raise your hand really high so they can see you. If you're at home, you run and grab some juice or some crackers and bread so that you can celebrate with us. But I wanna take you back on that night that Jesus gathered with his disciples. Even Judas was there, which, uh, who, who will have a prominent place in our story tonight? But Judas was there. In fact, all evidence suggests that he had the seat of honor next to Jesus. And they celebrated this meal as we will in part tonight with the first uh, and the, the primary two elements of that meal, the most important two elements that Jesus injected new meaning in. So if you've got your little chalice, if you want to peel off that bottom part um, and reveal the little white cracker there at the end. Um, Jesus would have taken, after the full meal, he would have taken a piece of matzah bread, unleavened bread, which as we've said in our Seder meal means that for that symbol, it's perfect. It's not sinful bread because leaven is sin. So this is a sinless piece of bread, if you'll indulge the expression. It's also pierced, it has holes in it, it's striped. It has been broken. It has been hidden away in a linen towel and then redeemed back. And now at this part of the meal, this bread is called the afikomen in Hebrew, which may mean something like dessert. Jesus would have taken this and said, this is me. Sinless, broken, pierced. It will be me in just a few hours. Broken, wrapped in a linen cloth, hidden away, and then brought back. This is the picture in a picture of my body, he said, and he broke it. And he said, I want you to take this tonight. And as you do, remember me. And so let's take it together as a church tonight. Father, we thank you for the broken body of your son, Jesus. His life was not taken from him. He willingly laid it down out of love for us. We bless you. We thank you. We celebrate and remember that great gift. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. After he broke the bread, he would take the third of the four cups of the Passover meal. It, again, if you celebrated with us, you know that these come directly from the I will statements from God in Exodus chapter six, verses six and seven. The first cup at the very beginning of the meal is the cup of sanctification. The second cup, during the ceremonial part of the meal is the cup of deliverance. If you did it with us, that's the cup that we dipped our finger in and let small drops of the wine or juice drip out. The third cup happened after the meal. That's why in all of our accounts, Jesus took the cup after the meal. And if you have your chalice and peel that off very carefully, you have at home your wine or juice, he would have lifted it up, red wine, and he would have said, this is a symbol and picture of my spilt blood. Now, blood in the Old Testament equals life, and blood must be shed for a sacrifice to cover sin and to bring one back into fellowship with God. And he said, this is my blood, a symbol of my blood, my life poured out for you. Every time you drink this, I want you to remember the cost of your salvation. They didn't understand in the moment, but they would in a very short amount of hours. This is the new covenant in my blood, he said, the covenant of forgiveness and grace. Every time you drink it, 
remember me. Let's take the cup together. Father, we bless you. Your scripture says that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. And your son, Jesus, eternal son of God, creator, sustainer, redeemer, willingly gave his life for us. We celebrate and remember and thank you. We pray all these things together in the name of Jesus. Amen. During that Passover meal, near the end, Jesus began a conversation. He began a, began a conversation with the disciples after he washed their feet. At one point, Judas leaves to take the final steps of his conspiracy plot to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. After that moment, Jesus begins to have a conversation with the 11 men and some women in the room. And we looked at that last Sunday in the Upper Room Discourse. At one point in that, he says, get up, let us go from here. So it becomes a traveling conversation. It ends with Jesus saying an incredible prayer, one of the longest that we have of Jesus in chapter 17. And then chapter 18 begins this way. And I want to look at this moment and talk about this subject because I think it's powerfully relevant for us and important. Every little step in the final culmination of God's redemption plan in Jesus is important for us. I hope this is relevant to you. Let's look at John 18. It'll be on your screens, the first four verses. After this prayer and conversation of the Upper Room Discourse, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron. So if he is on the eastern side of, excuse me, the western side of the city in the upper room and he goes through the temple mount and he exits the eastern gate of the temple. He would have gone down a sharp ravine and then up the other side where there's still today an olive grove, the entire mountain, the Mount of Olives was an entire olive grove and he would have entered a garden there called Gethsemane. Gethsemane in Hebrew means olive press. And even today, as in ancient times, they would press the olives three times, just like Jesus went and prayed to the Father three times with his disciples, with three of his disciples a little further, waiting. This is, remember, when they fell asleep. John doesn't record any of this because he wants us to see the same event from a slightly different angle. So when Jesus has spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the ravine of the Kidron where there was a garden in which he entered with his disciples. Now Judas. You see, John wants us to see something about Jesus and Judas. Now Judas, also who was betraying him, knew the place, for Jesus had often met there with his disciples. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort, a cohort is a battalion of soldiers, and in the time of Jesus, this meant as many as 600 soldiers, a Roman cohort, with officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Verse 4, so Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, whom do you seek? I want you to pay attention to that last phrase in verse 4. Jesus knowing all the things that were coming upon him. You see, I, I think that that phrase means that every part of these hours and moments together is important for us, is a part of the redemption plan, including betrayal by a friend. A friend whom he chose, whom he loved, whom he treated no differently than any of the other disciples who had the seat of honor at the Passover meal never saw in Jesus who he, Jesus said he was, never put his faith in Jesus, was always on the side, on the outskirts. Jesus still loved him and loved him to the end. And here's Judas. The rest of the Gospels, of course, say that he betrayed him with a kiss. Jesus, knowing all the things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to him, whom do you seek? Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever experienced betrayal? 
You may think of human relationships, that would be the first thing that we think of, someone who said they would do this but didn't, someone who was a friend but then is not a friend anymore, someone who made a promise and went back on that promise. You ever been betrayed? Let's zoom out and think of a bigger way. What about you being betrayed in the promises that someone has made you for your life, especially if you've trusted in your own designs and instincts and ways of doing things, which the scriptures tell us come from not God, but the enemy. And he says, no, this will work out. This will work out. This will work out. But it doesn't. And you've been betrayed. You've been betrayed by the enemy, the deceiver. It's the only thing he knows how to do. Have you been betrayed? I want you to know Jesus felt the sting of betrayal and it was part of the redemption plan for you. He felt the sting of betrayal and he endured it in order to rescue from experiencing it yourself so that you would not ultimately reap the wages of a lie from an enemy and be betrayed by him, that you would not have to be defined in your life by the betrayal of someone else, but that you could see in Jesus the only God who will never betray, who will never let down, who will never lie, who will never fail to keep a promise, the Redeemer. I think this episode with Judas is important for some of us, maybe important for you tonight. Have you been betrayed? Jesus felt the sting of betrayal and he endured it to rescue you from it. One day, I was just sitting in my office and I kept on getting phone calls. I didn't pick up because I was busy. And then finally, I picked up and it was the Montgomery County Sheriff's Department saying that your son Elijah has been in an accident. He's being transported to the ER. Neither one of us knew how serious it was until we got to the hospital. Both of his lungs collapsed. He broke his collarbone, he broke his scapula. He had severe road rash, a concussion. In the first 48 hours, there was one night, all the nurses, the doctors flew into the room. That's when I realized he could really die from this. It started out as just having like a glass of wine, you know, at the end of the day, but alcoholism runs in my family. It was an escape at the end of the day, and then that escape became earlier and earlier. I was lonely and just trying to fill a void. But I don't have the leadership or the strength to confront her on it or to come alongside her the right way. I felt like I was failing at leading my family. It was 3 a.m. and I just was sitting there with all this anxiety. I thought I was falling asleep. I was not. I was falling into a medical induced psychosis. This dark feeling was in my head. It was whispering so soft and so nice. And I could just feel once I followed that darkness, my body just losing everything. It basically came to a head when I just couldn't get through a day sober and it was affecting the way I was caring for my kids. You know, I didn't really want to drink at that point and God wasn't doing anything about it. And so I just got angry at him. But I'm also feeling bad, right? So I'm trying to find other ways to hide from it. So more time at work, that's seeking out pornography. It wasn't just escape, it was, if Jen knew I was doing this, it would hurt her. It was getting to a point to where we would have gotten divorced or I was gonna die. That was the lowest when I just stopped caring if I even made it to the next day. I know this was the hardest thing Ryan had to do. He had to call the police and paramedics. I had so much fear when I saw them walking up to our door. I sprinted down the street. I felt my cross necklace like come up and hit my chin. And I instantly stopped and I just thought, God is with me. I know he's gonna get me through this. I was trying to network with different physicians to understand what could be done. But at the same time, there was some level of futility in that, right? Because there's a limit to the technology, there's a limit to medicine, there's a limit to the doctor's knowledge. This was something we couldn't control. 
it didn't matter anymore. It was a matter of, was God going to heal him or not? You have to accept that he has a purpose. And we were praying, hoping, but we also have to prepare ourselves if that's not what he wants to happen. A neighbor of ours invited us to come to Faith Bible, and they had a group that they were starting called Regeneration. That was a recovery program. In my mind, it was, this would be great for Jen, and I will go just to support. I literally felt so broken because I was in an ambulance with no mind. And I remember thinking, is this gonna keep happening throughout my life? And when the ambulance stopped for me to get out and go to the hospital, I just remember praying to God as saying, if He could take my heart and mind and get me through everything, I would make sure everyone, the world, could see His love in me. Thinking about Good Friday and God giving up His own Son, before this happened, much more theoretical. As a mother, it still pains me. I wasn't there to go through that with him. And that makes me think about when he is dying on the cross and God can't do anything, but he chose to do it for me. It's a different kind of love. Talking about unconditional is really unconditional. Let me ask you, in these kind of stories, how can you redeem it yourself? In these of the most difficult challenges in life, some of these stories, how can you iron out all the wrinkles on your own? How can you make everything right? How can you heal your son? How can you get free of addiction on your own for good? to not let it be the thing that defines you. The scriptures would say that uh, the redemption of a man's soul is costly, that you should stop trying to do it yourself forever, that it's not possible. And in fact, the picture behind me on the center screen, um, very chaotic wood engraving from Germany that's 550 years old is actually the cost of redemption. It's a picture of the cost of redemption. There are lots of individuals and animals and action. It's very chaotic happening in this, but there is only one individual looking at you. And in the picture, he is intentionally larger in stature than everybody else. He looks like twice the size of everybody else because he is supposed to be the center. You're supposed to see him. That's the story of redemption, chaos, and this is the cost. As we continue our story, the Roman cohort took Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane with the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and their officers. Peter struck one of them, servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear, and Jesus healed him. There was all sorts of chaos, and then every one of them fled. All of Jesus' best friends left him. And he is taken to the house of Annas, who is the father-in-law of the high priest. He was the former high priest, so he's still highly respected. So he goes to Annas first and is questioned and tried, and then to Caiaphas, the real high priest in the time of Jesus. And as they approach the house of Caiaphas, Jesus is going, but we are brought in to two of the disciples. We talked about Judas last time in the sting of betrayal. I want to talk about Peter now. And we'll be in John chapter 18, verse 15, up on the screen. Now, Simon Peter was following Jesus, and so was another disciple. So it appears that in the Gethsemane Garden, the olive press, they ran away until they got to a safe place that they didn't feel like the Romans were going to get them to. And as they took Jesus, they sort of crept behind. As Jesus was brought into 
the house of Caiaphas. Simon Peter was following, and so was another disciple. We're taking this, I think it's right to take this as John, the disciple who's writing this, speaks, speaks of himself in the third person. Now that disciple, John, was known to the high priest and entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. So John, being the son of Zebedee, um, well-known person from Galilee and probably um, obviously has connections, was able to come in. I don't think he's near the right hand of Jesus. He's just in the crowd. But Peter was standing at the door outside. He didn't make it past the bouncer, so to speak, to get into the courtyard of Caiaphas. So the other disciple, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. John said, I'll handle this. We'll take you. I know this guy. You know, he's with me. Okay, great. And so Peter comes in. But watch. The slave girl who kept the door. This is the one who opened the door to Peter. He walks by and she says, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. This is not the only time that Peter said that, of course. He goes into the courtyard and warms himself by the fire because this is very late at night and it's cold that time of year. And people in the glow of the fire say, hey, I, I recognize you. Isn't your accent Galilean? Aren't you one of the followers of that Jesus? No, I am not. Third time, same thing, but this time with a curse and an oath, Peter. Has anyone ever rejected you? Have you ever felt rejected? Maybe at some point in your life you felt even rejected by God. Felt rejected by a friend, rejected by a spouse, a parent, maybe even rejected by the church, people who should be like Jesus and following Jesus. Have you ever felt rejection? The agony of rejection? I want you to know Jesus understood the agony of rejection. And it's part of your redemption story. It's part of the redemption story. And like the sting of betrayal, Jesus felt the agony of rejection and he embraced it in order to rescue you from it. So that rejection would not be the one word over your life. It would not be your story. Rejection by a person does not have to define you. And rejection by God because of your sin does not have to be the final chapter of your story. There can be a very, very different story. You see, Jesus experienced that himself. Not only with Peter here in the end, but think about the crowds, the Jewish leaders, even his own family at parts of the story think that he is insane. Jesus was familiar with the rejection. He felt the agony, the agonizing weight of rejection. And he embraced it. Remember, he knew all the things that were happening to him. He embraced it because he doesn't want you to be defined by rejection. He doesn't want your eternal story to be one of rejection. He says, I will embrace it to rescue you from it. It's another part of the redemption story that I hope connects to many of you today because it's one of the reasons why Jesus came. Where we left our story with Peter, Jesus was taken into Caiaphas's house and probably spent the night in the prison under his house. If you have had the chance to come with us to Israel and the Holy Land, um, chances are you climbed down into that pit with us as we remembered and read some psalms together. Lord willing, you'll have a chance to go with us in the future. He was pulled out of that pit early in the morning and taken to Pilate, the governor of Ju Jerusalem and Judea. He wanted to wash his hands. This was a Jewish problem. It's not a Roman problem. He wanted to stay clear of any possible rioting or difficulty. And so he said, you handle it yourselves. But the chief priests kept, kept asking. They said, we do not have the right to put someone to death. Only you can do that. And he said, wow, this must be serious. So he sent him to Herod, the king. 
Herod did nothing, sent him back to Pilate. Pilate brought him back to the people. The people asked him. Pilate brought him, Jesus asked him privately some questions, brought him back to the people. When Peter denies knowing Jesus three times, in the Gospel of John, Pilate, the Roman pagan, declares Jesus innocent three times. In the end, he sees no possible way through this, and so he thinks that punishing Jesus will be enough. So we get one sentence in the Gospel of John that's hard to overstate. Pilate then took Jesus and had him scourged. One sentence. The reality and horror of that one sentence would be nearly impossible for anyone in this room to stomach. In fact, most Roman criminals that were handed over to scourging didn't survive the process. Three stages, increasing brutality. Of course, Jesus did survive and was met with mocking, put a purple robe on him, crown of thorns, spit at his face, punched him, kicked him, and brought him back to Pilate. Pilate asked him some other questions, interrogated him once more, and then brought them Jesus, brought him Jesus back out to the people. We rejoin our story in John 19, verse 13. Therefore, when Pilate had heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew it's called Gabbatha or Lithostrotos. Um, if you've been with us in, in the Holy Land, we go to this place. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews as he brought Jesus out in his marred form, Behold your king. It's difficult to understand what he would have looked like in this moment. Probably barely able to stand. Recalls to mind Isaiah chapter 52, written 700 years before that day, when God through the prophet said, when they look at my people, Israel, they don't think you're special. They think, um, in fact, you're nothing to look at, rather reprehensible. And he says, just so. My servant, he will be marred more than any other man. He will be reprehensible. He will be shunned and rejected. A man from whom men hide their face in this moment. Behold your king. So the, the, the crowds led by the Pharisees and chief priests cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the last statement in this passage and on the screen is hard to really capture because we're removed from the situation. But a blasphemy on the lips of the chief priests and scribes, there may not be one larger than this. Their response, we have no king but Caesar. Consider for a moment, in the Passover, they pray at least four times for the cups of wine, several other times for the bread and the lamb. They say, Baruch Ata Adonai El Chenu, Melech, King, Melech HaOlam, King of the universe. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. And the chief priests look at Pilate and say, we have no king but Caesar. They led him away to meet his cross and going from the northwestern corner of the Temple Mount where the pavement Gabbatha is through the streets of Jerusalem out the city walls to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there they nailed him to that cross and put it upright in a place of great public traffic because this was supposed to be shameful. There was a Titleist on the top of the cross above his head that said his crime. Pilate wrote it. The Jews didn't like what he wrote. He said, 
Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. He said, the Jews said to Pilate, you should have written, he said that he was King of the Jews, and he said, what I have written, I have written. And he hung there for a good number of hours. Many criminals sent to crucifixion would actually hang on the cross for days. They die slowly. It's meant to be excruciating and humiliating, and you die of asphyxiation. You die because you can't breathe anymore. And Jesus was approaching this moment, and we conclude our story in John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scriptures, said, I am thirsty. Take a moment, and let's look at that first line again. Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished, including perhaps feeling the sting of betrayal so that he could rescue you and I from it, and feeling the agony of rejection so that he could rescue you and I from it. And he was about to take on the sin of the entire world. So in this moment, and John writes it so that two things are happening at the same time. And John's allowed to do this as an ancient Near Eastern biographer and historian. He, he does this for stylistic and very intense and intentional purposes. He shifts the death of Jesus to perfectly align, simultaneous with the death of the Passover lambs in the temple, thousands and thousands of them. So the Passover is happening at this very moment, according to the Gospel of John, in the temple, thousands and thousands of lambs. It is a bloody place. And they're being taken back to the homes all in Jerusalem. And they take hyssop, a, a weed in the ancient Near East, um, and they take it and dip it into the blood of the lamb and paint the lintel in the doorposts of their home. The only time that hyssop is mentioned in the New Testament is in this text. He said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there and they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Jesus is seen and is the perfect and ultimate Passover lamb. He is being crucified. He is being crowned with thorns. He is being pierced and striped at the very same time that everyone in Jerusalem is celebrating the death of a Passover lamb that redeems them. John lines it up so. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Again, John, with just a few words, captures what is difficult to understand. Can you imagine what was happening in heaven in this moment? With untold numbers of angels peering at this moment. The earth itself, we know from the scriptures, reacted to this moment. The skies turned dark. The earth itself under Jerusalem quaked and shook. Tombs were opened. People were resurrected from the dead in this moment. The veil of the temple was torn. The earth itself groans and reacts to the death of its creator. And Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, the innocent one becomes guilty and pays the cost so that the guilty ones, you and I, can be declared innocent and go free. It's hard to understand the beauty and depth of that exchange, but that is what's offered to everyone, offered to you. I read the story of a family in yesteryear in a time where some of these things in families were a little different. You see, the son had an obedience problem. He was told to come directly home from school in a small little nowhere town, Mayberry, whatever it was, come 
directly home from school every day, and he just chose not to. He disobeyed. He would go down to the creek. He would play around with his friends. He would get lost just staring at the clouds, and then he would stroll home. His parents are worried. Disobedient, he did not come home day after day. They tried punishment. They tried all these things. And finally, this day, he came home late. Mom set him down at his normal place for the evening meal, father at the head of the table. Except for this day in front of him was not a plate that looked like his father's. His father's had a big steak and potatoes and vegetables and bread and butter and a glass, big apple juice glass, which was the boy's favorite. But in front of the boy was just a piece of bread and a glass of water. No one spoke of his disobedience. They were trying to communicate something to him just with their eyes. And the father at the head of the table looks and the boy looks back and there was an unspoken understanding. This is my punishment. Yes. Once the father understood that the boy understood, he stepped up from the table, grabbed his plate full of steak, potatoes and vegetables, walked around to the sun, took his plate of bread and gave him the full plate and walked back to the head of the table where he sat and happily enjoyed just bread and butter and water. That boy later, as a man would write, all my life, I knew what God was like from that one night with my father. You see, we have in front of us a plate full of death and rejection and betrayal and denial and curse and sin. There is nothing we can do about it. But Jesus, with a plate full of perfection and righteousness and the presence of the Father and eternal life, gets up from his place, takes our plate of rejection and death and gives us his. And that's the beauty of the gospel message. Jesus devoured the wages of sin. He devoured them. And he satisfied its cost so that you can be free. So that we could be free by faith in him. The passage in Romans um, perhaps says it best, but there's a lot of big words. I'll put it up on the screen. Just do an exercise with me. I'll read through this passage and then we'll do something with it. Romans chapter 3. There's a couple of lines in red. Let's read it and then let's work our way. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Propitiation means satisfied, satisfied the wrath of God. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed and all the eons passed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at this moment in time, the death of Jesus, so that he would be both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. How can God the Father be just and also forgive you his, your sin? How can he be just and the justifier? Well, let's look at the red passages and work our way backwards. On the bottom, God the Father can be just and the forgiver of sins because he gives this declaration of righteousness as a free gift of his grace through all that Jesus accomplished on the cross because Jesus, God displayed him as a satisfaction of the wrath of God on sin. Jesus paid it all. And so we go up to the top now, apart from the law, which is apart from obedience to the law, which is apart from earning God's love by obedience to the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed in and manifested in a person, in Jesus Christ. It is not too late for you. It's never too late. But you can't earn it. You can't build it yourself. It is a gift that you receive. It is a gift that you receive, and it's a gift that's available to you tonight.